Here are our notes for our last chapter in AP2, Chapter 31, Nuclear Physics. So some of this is chem review again, but um, this is where we get into the power of making atomic bombs, right? So we know, we remember that the nucleus has protons and neutrons, and that equals the atomic number, which is A. Um, and so A minus Z, the um, atomic... All right. So the atomic number... This is the atomic, is an atomic mass, right? Let's fix that. So this, this is the atomic mass, right? And so if you take, the Z is the atomic number, right? Atomic number is Z. So if you take A minus Z, that gives you the number of neutrons. So remember that uh, Z tells you what it is, and A just how many extra neutrons it has on it. Now, this is the most important part, this U thing. So you'll see it on your uh, table of information, but U is the same as an atomic mass unit, um, which is the same as 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Obviously, you don't have to memorize that, but that number is on your table of information. And you know how um, in chemistry we always said protons and neutrons are the same mass and electrons have no mass? Well, guess what? They actually have their own masses. And so those numbers are super important. Notice that a neutron is slightly more than a proton. And while electrons are really tiny, they still have some mass. And all that makes a difference and adds up to the atomic mass that the uh, atom has. Um, but the most important things for this chapter are going to be our protons and neutrons, right? We've always worried about the electrons because they do electricity, but now we're actually into the nuclear energy of the nucleus, which is protons and neutrons. Now, we talked about the radius of the atom, but we also need to talk about the radius of the nucleus, which is directly related to the atomic mass. This is just in meters, so don't get confused. It's not times m. That just stands for meters. And all it means is that it has a bigger mass, has a bigger... If it has a bigger mass, it has a bigger radius. Um, so it's different for each atom, but the same density means bigger R, bigger mass, that kind of thing, right? That's all it is. So the energy of the nucleus is held together by this thing called the strong nuclear force. There's where the atomic bombs come from. That's where the sun sort of gets its energy from, or I talk about all that. Um, the positive protons do not want to stay together, right? They are being pushed apart all the time. And the neutrons kind of help keep them apart, but it still doesn't work very well. Um, so the neutrons help stabilize it, and if n is the number of neutrons is equal to z, it's fairly stable. But as you get a higher mass, you end up with more and more protons compared to neutrons, and it just gets more and more unstable. So after 83, things just sort of start spontaneously falling apart. And remember, we have something called an isotope, and an isotope has, for the same atom has the same number of protons, because protons determines what it is, right? That's the identity of the element, uh, but has a different number of neutrons, and some are just more stable than others. There's no way to know that unless you look at a table, and it'll show, like, the energy and which one's more stable. Um, but if you look at the periodic, yeah, that's how you spell periodic. You can spell it right. If you look at the periodic um, if you look at the periodic table, um, it tells you the average mass of an atom. If you take all the ones in nature with all the different isotopes, it gives you that average, but it's not the true mass of a single atom of that atom. So we have this thing called binding energy, um, which holds the uh, nucleus together, right? And it's a lot of energy because those protons, the more you add, don't want to stay together. They want to fall apart. And so um, if you put them together, um, it takes energy and they kind of hold that. But if you take them apart, you get that energy back. So the, if you added up the sum of all the protons and all of the neutrons that were inside a nucleus, it would not equal the mass of the whole. That extra mass gets converted into energy. That's where the famous equation, yes, you've been waiting for it, E equals delta mc squared comes from. Now remember, c is the speed of light. So think of the speed of light squared and the difference in mass between what it was separately and what it is combined is converted into energy. So it either is taken up 
to make it turn into a nucleus, or it's given back when the nucleus comes apart. Um, so either way can, can work. Um, just realize that this equation is in joules. Super important that you realize that if you're going to set that equal to your energy or anything, you have to have it in joules. And then we have this interesting conversion. This is really just a conversion table, right? 1U is the same as 931.5 mega electron volts, which is the same as 1.6 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Think about that. A kilogram is now energy, right? This is showing you that mass and energy are the same thing. Just like we said, waves and energy and matter and all that. Well, here we see it is this is the conversion between mass and energy. So for this tiny amount of mass, you get this amount of energy, which is quite a lot. So here's an example for making helium. So helium, as we know, is made of two hydrogens and two neutrons, and you put those together and they form a helium. Um, so if you look at the appendix, it'll tell you, you know, well, first, you multiply two times one, because that's the mass of a, of a um, proton, um, and this is the mass of a neutron. I know it says, he, it is hydrogen, but it's just hydrogen nuclei, so it's, it's two, it's really two protons, if you think about it, and two neutrons. So uh, the mass of a proton is 1.0078. The mass of an elect of a neutron is 1.0087, right? Neutron, proton. And so if you added that up, two of those and two of those, you get a grand total of 4.0330 U's. But if you look at the appendix or anywhere online and you find out what the mass of a helium atom is, you notice it's 4.0026 U. This is known as the mass defect. I first used to think it was like the mass deficit, but it's not. It's really called the mass defect. And so you just subtract that, and you end up with point, there should be a point there, right? Point zero three zero four u And then if you multiply that times 931.3, the conversion factor per U, you get 28.3 mega electron, volt, electron volts of binding energy. And then lots of times we like to think of it as energy per nucleon. Now, a nucleon is protons or neutrons. And so since in the helium atom, there are four, because there's two of those and two of those, and two plus two equals four, then if I look at the energy per nucleon, it's 28.3 divided by four, so it's 7.08 mega electron volts per nucleon. Now, this is just for helium. This is what's going on in the sun. Right? The sun takes hydrogen, right? It takes a hydrogen, and it takes a hydrogen, and it puts it together, and it makes a helium. And when it does that, it's putting out this energy for every single nucleus it puts together. It takes a lot of energy to do that. Now, we are trying to do cold fusion, which would be great, but right now it takes so much energy to get these guys to go so fast, right? You have to have so much energy that it's not quite feasible. But the last time I went to San Diego, they did say they are very close. Matter of fact, they are building a facility in Europe of everybody together to try to make this work. So it's, they're scaling it up. Um, and it might be in your lifetime that we actually have cold fusion, which would help with our energy crisis. Let's cross our fingers that happens. So then we have this thing called radioactivity, right? And you've all heard of radioactivity. It's just atoms spontaneously giving off particles to become more stable. Remember how I said that as you get past 83 um, for the atomic number, um, they just become unstable and they don't want to be that way. And so they just start throwing out stuff out of their nucleus because I'm not stable and so I'm going to throw this stuff out. So that's what radioactivity is. It's just decaying until it becomes more stable. So there are different types of decay. One is called gamma, and no, that doesn't really look like a, you know, gamma, it's our typical gamma, um, which is just a photon, so there's no mass, there's no charge, and so you start with cobalt, you end with co cobalt, but the thing is, it's more stable than it was before because it gave off a little bit of energy. Um, so that's just known as gamma decay. So there's, there's no um, change in the nucleus per se, there's still the same number of nucleons, um, it's just a little more stable because it gave off a little bit of energy. Then we have alpha decay. Now, alpha decay is basically uh, a helium nucleus, so we represent it with an alpha or with a helium, so you'll see it both ways. Um, so here it is as helium-42, here it is as alpha-42, they're both, both written that way. Um, the mass of a helium, remember, is four U's because there's four nucleons in there, remember, it's just the nucleus. Um, it does have a charge of two uh, positive E, right, because it's got two protons and two neutrons. 
in there. Um, and just remember, you have conservation of charge and conservation of mass. So if you look at down here, right, 86 plus 2 is equal to 88, and 218 plus 4 is equal to 222. So it's always easy to figure out what things are. So if you see this and you know it has an alpha, you say, oh, 238 minus 4 is 234. That doesn't really help me much except for I know it has a mass of 234. But then I say, oh, 92 minus 2 um, is 90, so then I can look up on the periodic table 90 and know that that's thorium, right? So that's kind of how that works. Oh, and it's called a daughter nucleus, right? Um, this is the alpha particle, and then this is the daughter nucleus of what's left after it decays with alpha decay, just terminology. Then we have beta decay. Beta decay um, is just an electron, so it's zero, negative one, or you write it as a beta. Um, what basically happens is the neutron turns into an electron and into a proton. Um, kind of interesting, right? So that the mass basically stays the same because a neutron and a proton, I know they don't have the same, but close enough for our purposes for right now. I know. When is it? When is it not? In this case, it stays the same, right? Notice the mass is still 14, right? But because the neutron is turned into an electron, you've actually changed the charge, so it has to be one more because you gave out a negative and you have to have conservation of charge, and seven minus one is equal to six. It does give off an antineutrino at the same time, not super important, but it's just sort of an energy. Um, if you have a um, positron, right? A positron is the same thing, except for now it's a electron that's positive, right? Um, and then it gives off, uh, I think it's a positive neutrino, po a neutrino, oh, it's, I, anyways, it's not, so you have an antineutrino, yeah, there it is, and a neutrino, right? So it's not super important, I don't see them doing much with positrons, you should know the basic beta decay, um, and to make sure the charges and the masses all come out to be the correct numbers, right? So whatever's on the left is the same as what's ever on the right, just like you did in chemistry. Then we have this thing called half-life. You should do this in calculus. Uh, they don't really push this in AP2 that much, but it's good to understand the concept and what it's used for. So half-life is the time it takes for half of a sample of the nuclei to decay, not the mass. That's important to understand. It's the nuclei, right? So I've got this thing, right, and it's made up of some neutrons, right, and some... And it decays, and it decays, and it decays. And so I end up with half the number of nuclei, right? Not the half the mass, because it depends on what the mass was. Um, and it's totally spontaneous, and it's just on average how long that will decay. We're going to do a lab, hopefully, when we come back. Cross your fingers. Um, that will show how that works, so it'll make more sense. Um, but the equations. So the equation for half-life is ln of 2 over lambda. Now, you would think, <laughs> lambda, that's wavelength. No, lambda is the decay constant, which is in per seconds, right? Uh, so it's just a constant, and it's 1 over seconds. Activity is how many things are decaying per second. So it's disintegration. So this disintegrates, and then it disintegrates, and then it disintegrates. So every second, how many disintegrate? And that's known as Becquerel's, right? It's disintegrations per second. And N, the capital N, is the number of nuclei. So half-life is ln of 2 over lambda, which is the same as 0.693 over lambda. And activity, right, activity is change in the number of nuclei per time, and that's equal to lambda times n naught, which is what's the original sample. So I have my original sample, and then it's the change in my n when I get down here over the amount of time that it took to get from point A to point B. All right. Um, so these two equations are very similar. The reason they use them in calculus is because it's a nice example of a natural log. But um, n at any given time, right, n at any given time is equal to n naught times e to the negative lambda t, and the activity is equal to a naught times e to the negative lambda t. It's the same equation. Um, it's just different ways to look at it since you've got a and you've got n. It's the same thing. This one. Right? So you can see what the, we know that if we use the activity as 0.23, but now we know what the current activity is, you can solve for t and you can figure out how much time has elapsed. That's it. That's all of chapter 31. Other units for activity, um, I like to bring this up just so you kind of are aware of it. Uh, there's something called a curry after Madame Curie, um, which is 3.7 of 10 to the 10th Becquerels. There's rent gins, 
which is R, which is due to x-rays and gamma rays only. Then there's grays. That's the one that they use sometimes um, to see, you know, if there was a nuclear bomb going off, how much you can absorb um, into the biological material in joules per kilogram. There's radians, which is like a gray, and then there's REMS. This is the one you hear the most, is REMS, how it affects the body compared to a standard x-ray, because basically um, they they will set a number of REMS you're allowed to have. People who are near radioactive material use you wear a badge, and that badge shows the number of REM, and if it goes like red because you had too many REMS for your period of time, then they say, oh, you can't come in here anymore because you've got too much, because it keeps adding up and it never goes away. Right? Where was it? So the reason that radioactive decay is important is because it allows for carbon dating. Now, carbon dating is only based on living tissue being replaced by carbon constantly. What that means is that there's a certain amount of um, carbon in the atmosphere, and as you live and breathe and do your respiration stuff, um, you have a certain amount of carbon in your body um, that is a certain type. But the normal, and the normal activity is 0.23 becquerels. Um, remember, that's the centigrations per second. And the T half, see, that's the nice thing. The T one half for carbon is 5,730 years. So what happens is you die. You don't keep replacing your carbon. Your carbon starts getting used up, and it starts decaying. And so your activity goes down. But it only goes down by half every 5,730 years. So it's really nice for, like, things that are super old. Like, you couldn't use it for something that was 10 years old, and you couldn't figure it out from that. Even 100 years old, right? It needs to be at least 6,000 years old old before you can even figure out how old it is, but millions of years you can definitely use it. And so you just uh, can figure out how many half-lives have gone through um, based on the activity. So you can go back and use our